This video is about how to create a wild garden or wildlife garden in a small space. At the recent RHS Chelsea Flower Show, the rewilding garden got best in show and a gold medal, but it created a lot of debate in the gardening world, with people wondering how wild you can actually make an urban garden, how practical it is, and indeed whether it is more work or less work than a traditional garden. So I've come to talk to Anne Vincent, who has had a wild garden for just under two years. The garden is of average size, it's about 60 feet long and less than 20 feet wide, and it's become a wonderful haven for wildlife. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog, and I'll put links to any resources we mention in the description below. And if you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap subscribe. So Anne, tell me what gave you the idea for this wildlife garden? Well it was really my son's idea. He's doing an open university degree in environmental science and he's also, he works as a farm manager so he's really into conservation. So when I bought this house, the garden was very plain. It was just grass, it was just an oblong of grass so it was a blank canvas really. And he said to me, Mum, you need a pond. And I thought he was going to dig me a, a small pond at the end of the garden. And uh, he said, no, you need a, a pond that's big enough so it sustains itself. And it's deep enough and y you won't have to have any sort of water features or, or, or anything. So he started digging and he dug it all by hand. And it was a very hot day in August, two years ago. And he has, I understand, he's linked the water that comes off the roof to the pond. So it is actually all rainwater and it comes straight off the roof and into the pond. Yes, it's really important not to have tap water going into the pond because it has so many nutrients in it that it will create algae, it'll encourage uh, algal growth. So yes, the rainwater pipe comes off the back of the house and every time it rains it goes straight into the pond. When the pond overflows there's another a pipe that goes off to a bog garden. I have one rainwater butt that, that's connected to the shed. So the, the water from the shed roof goes into the butt and then I can, there's a pipe connecting that straight into the bog garden so I can top up the bog garden um, but I'd, I have plans to get another water butt or maybe three water butts so that I've always got a supply yeah. of rainwater because again I don't want to introduce tap water because of the nutrients and it will affect the acidity of the soil and therefore the plants that, that grow and I want to keep it as natural as possible if I can. Just back to the pond for a moment your son dug it and then yes. you lined it and yes. you got the water down from the roof with yes. the pipe. So what did you do after that? The liner was bedded in and then we ordered some stones. They're actually Scottish pebbles <laughs> which have a lovely colour to them. And you've got at one end is a sort of shallow beach just so that animals can get in and out. And yes. Smaller animals and bigger animals can all get in and out. That's right, yes. I mean particularly hedgehogs, although I don't have any hedgehogs in the garden, unfortunately. But yes, birds bathing every day, uh, which is lovely. And so tell me about the other elements in the garden. There's the, the decking and the path, and then yes. there are the, the dividers. So tell yes. me how those were decided. Yes, on. yes. The purpose of the decking, apart from to get from one end of the garden to the other, is to keep people off the ground. So, so the decking also creates a void, so underneath the decking is, is another habitat and, and we've hidden all sorts of stones under there um, that we found in the garden so yes it's another habitat. And so of course all the soil under the decking is absolutely lovely for worms and microorganisms and everything like that because it's not being compacted by stone or brick or pavers. That's right, that's right. And also the decking means that you don't have to walk on the garden at all. And then the dividers talk us through the screens, the yes. natural log screens. Yes. Well, they serve two purposes, really. One is to give structure to the, to the garden, because as your eye looks down the garden, you're sort of encouraged to look around the corner. Uh, so it has that function. But it's full of wood, native wood, which will rot down and create another habitat for all sorts of beetles, 
all the invertebrates and creatures that we need to encourage in order to create the ecosystems that have been not totally destroyed, but... Uh, they're it, struggling. Yeah, they're really struggling, yes. Tell me about how you did that, because this is literally posts knocked into the ground and then yes. uh, logs wedged in between them, is that it right? It is, yes. Uh, this was totally experimental and we will probably take it apart and redo it at some point, but the posts are untreated wood and that's quite important so they again they will naturally rot down if you had a bigger garden mm. and you were pruning then you would put anything you pruned mm. into that yeah and looking at the tree i imagine that was here when you were here because it looks quite well aged yes that's a, that's an old bramley apple tree and it, it was the only thing in the garden when i moved here so obviously i wanted to preserve that. It, w it was quite overgrown, the, the apple tree, and so yes, we, we pruned it quite hard and shaped it. Obviously, because it's a small garden, the tree is affected by lack of light from other gardens, so it, it sort of will grow in one direction or the other. What have you done about the boundaries? Because there are some low old walls, but you've built up on them as far. We put some trellis on the top of the wall and on the, on the other side on the fence in order to grow creepers and plants, all native plants. And we planted them quite close together so that we get a nice, you know, sort of almost instant hedge that's yeah. only 18 months old. Mm -hmm. And the roses were lovely and they will have, there will be another crop of so it's got roses. honeysuckle and roses, and is that beech that I can see there? That's oh. hazel. Hazel, yes. yes. There's, a, well, there's a wild cherry in there, quite a lot of hawthorn and blackthorn yes. in there. But underneath the apple tree, you've got a small seating area, and you've got a mix of different things like pavers, sand, bark, and the decking. So yes. what was the thinking behind that? Well, underneath the, the tree, it's a very shaded area, so I wanted to have some ferns under there. So I've created a sort of little fern garden and I've tried to keep the ferns to native varieties. To, again, it's another ecosystem, another, um, another area for wildlife and I've put some bark chips down just to sort of see what, what grows there and, and what lives there and enjoys that more acidic environment. And then beyond the seating area, is the start of a sand garden. So Tom has an idea to create a sand dune and then to grow some plants that, that like that environment. He got that idea from Hampton Court a couple of years ago. They had a sand garden uh, in there. So that's that area. And this is uh, this grid here mm -hmm. is that is to just to make it easier for wheelbarrows and things is it yes it was really built as a base for the shed oh right so it's an alternative to a concrete base and so you've just tied the nettles back rather than i have i it's have tied them back because when i come through with my bike they yes. get me I bet so. they do. Yes, I <laughs> and in terms of the plants which plants have you put in and are they much work to look after i have put very few plants in the garden the pond plants I did buy in, but again, they're all native pond plants. But the plants in the garden itself ha have sort of blown in on the wind. I did have a couple of packets of seeds, wildflower seeds, which I planted probably 18 months ago. The majority of the plants have found their way here themselves. And as far as gardening goes, the gardening that I do is really to enjoy it mainly, I <laughs> watch it, but I do remove some of the plants that are taking over. Now, over time, there will be a natural rhythm to, to the plants and the planting. For example, creeping buttercup, there's lots of creeping buttercup, and at first I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to dig this up, and you know, the word invasive comes in. But I didn't, I left it, and what I found is that other plants control it. So other native plants sort of grow around it and then there's a bit of a competition and they're all sort of there doing their thing. So I do very little gardening. <laughs> so that's sort of no deadheading or watering or anything like that? No, mm. no, just does its own thing. I mean, the garden is very new. 
So last year, last autumn, I did nothing. I didn't do anything with it. This autumn, I may stream the the top off but I'll see how it goes it's all a learning experience really and um, with the bog garden did you introduce any specific bog garden plants or have they just found their way in there apart from European sundew which is a, a carnivorous plant everything else has just found its way in there there's all sorts of different mosses there's a little a plant called pennywort that's now flowering. And so this is alkanet, and that doesn't, yes. I mean, that gets out of control in my garden, but <laughs> we're saying here that the plants kind of boss it about. Exactly. It yes. And then is that Dorcas Croatia, wild carrot? Do you that think? is. Yes. That's a wild carrot, yes. Yeah. It's just surprising how quickly things are, are just growing and, yeah. I've got a wildlife and eco playlist which I'll put at the end of this video and do let me know what you think and thank you for watching. Goodbye.